Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless your name for bringing us together. Thank you for the love you have given your people to always come like this for leaders' development. We pray, Lord, our coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We pray you reveal ourselves to us. Show us ourselves in the mirror of your word. And whatever needs to be corrected, Lord, we pray you grant us the earnestness, the faithfulness, the willingness to correct everything in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are coming to James chapter 2. But before I read from verse 1, I want to read chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. As we come to leadership development sessions, we need to take that to heart so that we are not heavy in the head but empty in the heart. Everything we hear is supposed to make a change, a transformation in our lives, in our ministries, so we can be more effective. But it says in verse 23, verse chapter 1, But if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, the same is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and he goeth his way. He comes on Monday or Tuesday, or Thursday, or Saturday, or Sunday. And yet, everything he hears, he beholds himself in the mirror of the world. And then he goes his way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Everyone must cons confess and accept that this has been true of many people, and maybe of each one of us, if we are taking in everything we have heard, everything we have learned, if we have taken notice of everything we saw in the mirror of the Word of God, and we went to Calvary, and we dipped ourselves in the blood of the Lamb, we will not be at the place, at the situation, at the level, at the height where we are now. We would have gone higher. That's why it says in verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. It's actually talking about the word. But you look at that word, and you take it like work. And you're a doer of that word, and of that work, it says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And as we come to what we're looking at tonight, in chapter 2, it's so very important, and it affects our personal lives, affects our families, affects the various committees in the church, affects the appointment of leaders in the church, workers in the church. It affects our evaluation of other people when we're bringing them into the service of the Lord. It affects quite a lot of things. And so it's very important that we open our hearts and open our ears and hear the word of God and let the word do good in every life. It will do good in your life in Jesus' name. Now, before we go on, I need to let you understand that while I'm preaching, I might sneeze. I might clean my nose. You know, sometimes it's like that. 
you know, every time it's not the mountain top. And it will be canal for anyone to mock the pastor while preaching. I sneeze and then you sneeze. I cough and then you cough. It shows that you really don't have respect that instead of my staying at home and saying I'm having, you know, this challenge, I've been here and there and all that, instead of giving any excuse, I still want to sacrifice. And then somebody is making fun of that sacrifice, that will be sinful. And so please understand that you're not coming here for show. You're not coming here for play. We're coming because and I'm giving all I'm giving because I'm committed to you and I'm your servant. I want to serve you and I pray that my service will be beneficial to you in Jesus' name. And the church said, we're coming to chapter 2 of James, verse 1. My brethren, have not the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Verse 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and have become judges of evil thoughts? Verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. If you are partial, it says you commit sin. If you have respect of persons and you are not equitable, you are not dealing with everybody in the proper way, you are partial, it says you commit sin and you are convinced of the law as transgressors. We're coming to First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. It says, all that we do in the ministry, everything we do in the church, we observe everything. We carry out everything without preferring one above, before, beyond another. Doing, tell me there. I can't hear your voice now. Doing nothing by partiality. That is in any area of the work. Every area of the work will do nothing by partiality. Actually, impartiality is the attribute of God. Impartiality is the character of God. And when we come to Christ and we come and we're born again, we're in the kingdom. It's also the character and the characteristic of the godly. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the great characteristic impartiality of God and the godly. The great characteristic impartiality of God and the godly. Impartiality is one of the attributes of God. He is impartial in his dealings with everyone, man or woman. He is impartial with everyone in every age and in every race. God is just and fair. That's what I would say. He's impartial. God is unbiased, unprejudiced. He doesn't say, you, you will never do well. You, whatever you do, I'm going to pardon you, even if you don't repent, and I'm going to put you in a place of honor. Not at all. It's not biased, it's not prejudiced, it's non partisan, and it's dispassionate in its dealings with mankind. Its conditions of salvation, the same for everyone. It says, repent and believe the gospel. Also, it's showing mercy 
unto anyone. He doesn't have different standards by which he shows mercy, showing mercy, or is accepting anyone. His condition of acceptance is the same for everyone. His condition of sanctification is the same for everyone, and its condition of anyone getting to heaven, the same for everyone, whether high or low, whether rich or poor, whether the person is illiterate or highly educated, he has the same standard that he maintains with everyone in calling us into service. He doesn't say, okay, you have to be saved, you have to be sanctified, and you, hmm, you're not really saved, but you occupy a great position in society. And if we make you a worker, if we make you a pastor, if you make you an assistant pastor, you will draw people to the church. Of course, he will. Of course, she will. But she will draw, and he will draw people like himself. And once you put that position on them, and they are not born again, they are not saved, they have not repented, there's no restitution, and there's no righteousness in their lives, already not they're exalted to that high position, they remain like that, and they may remain like that because they're committed to that leader who appointed them, they're committed to that church, they may remain like that until the rapture happens, until they die, and they may not make heaven. And the people that come through them might be the same. And so that's the reason why if we look at the conditions that God gives in bringing anyone into the ministry, rich or poor, the same standard, high or low, the same standard, men of authority, men of power, the same standard, the people that, have, that are ruling and their subjects, the same, the same standard, each one has to repent. Each one has to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one has to go through that same straight gate, that little gate that leads to heaven, and it's not going to take you and your sin. Each one must walk in the narrow way that leads to heaven. And so, when we're talking about the impartiality of God, it means that we present the same message to everyone. And we present the same way of life to everyone. We don't lower the standard for anyone at all. The word of God is for everyone. That means then, as we think about this impartiality, as for God, it's very clear. But now, that same quality of impartiality is demanded and expected of every true Christian and every minister of God. Partiality in our dealings with people is condemned by God and will disqualify us before him now and in eternity. The topic, as I said tonight, is the great characteristic impartiality of God and the godly. Three things we're going to concern. Number one, the impartiality of our immutable God and maker. Immutable, unchanging unchangeable, constant, the same every time. And the impartiality of that immutable God and our maker. Point number two. The inconsistency of inexcusable and gifted men, gifted men in position, position in the church, authority in the church, and they have gifts. That's why God put them there. God does not put just anybody that does not have some quality, some skill. And yet you find that these men, supposed to be men of God, gifted men, they are inexcusable because they are inconsistent. They know what they ought to do. And they know that this is the way. The way for people to get into salvation, they know the way. And the message of sanctification, yes, they know. And the quality, the qualification that God requires in bringing anyone into the service of God, they know. And the thing that God is looking for, what he appreciates, they know. And yet they are inconsistent in bringing people into the ministry. Either because... I want to encourage him. 
I don't want him to, you know, stray to another, another church, another place. And he is very significant. He has a lot of talents, you know. He can do this, can do this, can do that. And if we just uh, pin him down with his activity, then it's not going to go anywhere. That's inconsistent. When other people come, you see, here, if you want to serve the Lord, you want to walk, you want to, you know, be in the ministry here, here is it. You lay it on the line. But when it comes to some people, you're selective in applying the standard of the word of God, the inconsistency of inexcusable and gifted men. Point number three, the integrity of incorruptible and godly ministers. There are ministers that are incorruptible. They are uncompromising. They stand and stay with the standard of the word of God. They have integrity. You cannot bribe them. You cannot bring gifts to them that will bribe them. You cannot bring money to them that will turn their mind to you. If you are not living right, you cannot bring this and bring that. You cannot flatter them. You cannot cajole them. You cannot do anything that will influence them towards you against the standards and the principle of the word of God. They are godly and they are incorruptible. They have integrity. The integrity of incorruptible and godly ministers. Point number one. God is impartial. Somebody give me a good amen. The impartiality of our immutable God and maker. Uh, you just run through the Bible. Uh, the, the verses don't need uh, too much explanation. The verses are very clear. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 17. For the Lord your God is the a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible and a terrible which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward that's god he is impartial second chronicles chapter 19 i'm reading here from verse 7 second chronicles chapter 19 and i'm reading here from verse 7 in verse 7 wherefore now let the fear of the lord be upon you Take it and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no respect of persons, no taking of gifts. That's God. It's straightforward. It's plain. It's open. It's predictable. He is uncompromising. There is no respect of persons with him and uh, there is no partiality with him. You say you are born again. What is the nature of God in you? You say you are a child of God. What is this character and characteristic of God in you? Job chapter 34. In Job chapter 34, I'm reading from verse 19. It says, how much less to him that accepted not the persons of princes, how much less to him that accepted not the persons of princes. I'm sure you've seen, uh, you know, maybe you've not uh, interacted with other churches. Maybe that's okay for you because uh, the Lord even wants us uh, getting too much or too close to the people that are understanding on the word of God. Let's we learn their ways. But there are places where princes come in, there's no repentance, there's no salvation, there's no holiness, there's no restitution, there's no practical demonstration of a change of life. But those ministries and ministers will put them in office. They don't even know their lives. Maybe because they bring great good offering. 
maybe because uh, you know of their you know exposure in society but you know in the case of god it says it doesn't have respect of persons of the princes nor regardless the rich more than the poor you know if you're a pastor local pastor you have to be very careful that the rich people you know they come they always you know they always introduce themselves and interact very well and they're always coming always coming always coming and the poor man does not come like that what's he coming for he doesn't have anything to offer and some of the people instead of offering to god directly and they we don't know what they're doing they come to bring that gift or that offering or that money financial directly to the pastor and they bring in it everything i just thought about you i should bring this to you i just thought about you that you'll need this one i just thought about you i traveled and then i brought this to you and they buy you over but not god if you are like that you're not like god because it says god regardeth not the rich more than the poor for they are all the work of his hands we're coming to exodus exodus chapter 32 exodus chapter 32 we're looking at verse 33 exodus chapter 32 i'm reading from verse 33 the lord said unto moses the lord said unto moses here is the lord himself here is the impartiality of god the lord said unto moses whosoever have sinned against me him will i blot out of my book god says i don't have different standards of discipline i don't have different approaches to chastisement whosoever and that thing affected Moses even after. You know, when God told him to speak to the rock and water will come out for the children of Israel, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. God could have said, or settle that privately, Moses, you're the meekest man on the earth. And you know how much I love you. How could you do that? If another person had done that, I know what I would have done. But Moses be very careful okay go your way go ahead no whosoever has sinned against me he will i blot out of my book which have written his name comes out of the book of life when he continues in sin and when he does not repent you remember how many times moses told the lord oh lord forget that thing now forgive that thing now and god said stop talking about that that's the impartiality of god yes he loves yes he has mercy but he has conditions and his conditions are firm his conditions are very clear look at joshua chapter 7 joshua chapter 7 and i'm reading here from verse 1 joshua chapter 7 we're looking at it from verse 1 but the children of Israel committed a trespass in their cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Kamai, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took up their cursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And you are saying that you know God could be angry against Egypt against Assyria, I about Israel. These people is referred to as my son. Let my son go. And yet it says now because they are done evil, God has just one standard. An impartial man has just one standard. An impartial minister has just one standard. An impartial church has just one standard it's not like you know that's so and so and you know why you know people prefer this to this to that and sometimes it's not just because they love that person sometimes it's because they are afraid they're frightened that man is a man of power that man is a man of authority that man has connections this other fellow doesn't have anybody, doesn't know anybody. He doesn't know anybody in the church. Doesn't have anybody outside the church. And whatever you do to him, he cannot, what can he do? Therefore, you don't fear him. And you treat him anyhow. But this other fellow, 
be very careful. You're being careful for your life. And you're not watching over the word of God. You're afraid because of those connections. And because of what they can do against you. That's why people are partial in the case of God. It's not like that. Look at verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Which is beside Bethaven on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, Let not all the people go up, just saying, The few. And he said, A few. Look at verse 5. And the men of Ai smote them, about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content to we had been satisfied and uh, to dwell on the other side, Jordan. Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? And then he goes on, verse 10, and the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. And I have only one standard. Israel has sinned. And I have only one way of dealing with any individual, any family, any community, any nation. Whether that nation is Israel or that nation is Edom. I have just one standard. That's the impartiality of God. Israel has sinned in verse 11. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their corset thin, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it among their own store. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither, look at this, neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. You see that attitude of God. So he said, up and sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed sin in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until thou take away the accursed sin from among you. The same standard. And the same standard, he wants us to a kind of follow today. That whoever the person is, you don't have selective approach. The same approach that one has seen. And the fellow is so close to you. And you had promised the person before, and say, I want to stand by my word. God promised Joshua and Israel, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. And he said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life until you come to see me. No man will stand before you. But now sin came in and, and God dropped that word. That's, that's the way he deals with everyone. And yet, come to Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah, chapter 3. And here we're reading from verse 1. Jonah, chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and that's the word of the Lord and that is the dealing of the Lord you remember Israel was overthrown when they sinned, and these Ninevites, they had been sinning without any check, without interruption, without control. And God sent Jonah and said, destruction, judgment has come. Impartial. But now look at verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them for the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and then you know the story it caused the people to turn away from their sins he said in verse 8 but let every man beast and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto the Lord. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do to them and he did it not. That's his principle. When you repent, anyone, anyone, anywhere from Nineveh, from Israel, from Greece, from Rome, from Nigeria, from Africa, anyone who repents, I'll pardon, I'll forgive. That's his impartiality. And so we see God's unchanging character of impartiality demonstrated in all those accounts we have read. And this is what gives us confidence in his promises. It gives us confidence in his warnings. It gives us confidence in his threats. If God was partial, we could not trust him. If God was partial, we couldn't trust his word. And, but this proper attitude towards whosoever hands him our love, this attitude of uh, dealing with everyone whosoever the same way, and that's what earns our trust, our faith, our obedience, our submission. The purifying fear of God that keeps us from sin is anchored on his impartiality. The reason we have the fear of God is that we know he has no favorite. If we go the wrong way and we rub the edge of his sword, if I go into a court, it is that fear of God that is anchored on his impartiality that makes us to know that whatever he says he will do, he will do. And we better obey that word, Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 12 and verse 13, Romans Chapter 10, verse 12, and verse 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. You see that? That's the impartiality of God. There is no difference. The way he deals with the Jew and the way he deals with the Gentile. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call, whosoever from the Jews, whosoever from the Greeks, whosoever from the Gentile world, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come to chapter 11. The impartiality of a immutable God and maker. We're looking at Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity. 
but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness of the wise thou also shall be cut off you're not a favorite because you know this is who you are in the church this is your position in the church this is your title in the church you're not a favorite you are in and you are standing because of his goodness because you repented because you believe in the lord jesus christ because you are willing to live in newness of life behold the goodness of god on the other hand behold the severity of god god is severe against the jews because they will not stand on his word and he has just one principle but now he says in verse 23 and they also think about that and they also if they abide not still in unbelief shall be grafted in for god is able to grab them in again still telling us is the impartiality of god we'll come to point number two the inconsistency of inexcusable and gifted men we're going to pick up one man and that will illustrate for all the other gifted men. And this man we're going to pick up is David. And we're going to see that he knew the law of God. He ought to. He ought to. As a king in Israel, he ought to know the law of God. And he knew it. He knew it. Look, look at this. Leviticus chapter 19. And look at the law of God. The way king david should have acted and the way king david should have been impartial consistently whether it affects your son absalom or it affects your son amnon or it affects anyone close to you the same standard is what god would have effected if god if everything was left in god's hand and he expected that david the king will have that same attitude what's the law of god we're looking at leviticus chapter 19 verse 15. leviticus 19 verse 15 ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment thou shalt not respect the person of the poor nor honor the person of the mighty but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor the same standard here is a group pastor and he has pastors under him district pastors and let's say a b c d and e five of them and d a group a, a pastor on a day's group pastor did something and then the group pastor said this is what i heard this is what happened yes i'm sorry it happened okay you understand this is not right this is lowering the standard you re, you understand our motto in the church honestly contending for the faith which was was delivered on saints you didn't do that step aside and pray for some time and now be another pastor in that group does exactly the same thing but more terrible in size more terrible in weight and the same group pastor who told d sit down pray he called b and as he called b remember this b now is highly placed for saved and came to our church and went through the lines and became a district pastor from the rich angle of community and the group pastor called him and the group pastor cannot even look at his face directly and is looking down and then he begins with sir as a pastor under him and you can tell it's not going to uphold the standard already he's referring to him as sir i had that oh before you finish yes whatever you had that happened and that happened 
and I know what you do to other people, but if, if you want to deal with me like that, go ahead, go ahead, and then we'll see the result. But I'm only, I just want to tell you ahead of time that the church will not break on your head. You know what it means? If you handle me with impartiality, if you apply the same standard of the word of God that you apply to D, you must be very careful. If you do that, I will, if you tell me to go and sit down, I'll go and sit down. But people are going to be asking me, and they will look away from you. I'll be the concentration and the focus of attention, and the church will break on your head. And because of that, he is not able to deal with that situation with impartiality. And because of that, he'll say, all right, but make sure you pray. Make sure we're still keeping the standard. Sir, if you are not keeping the standard, nobody else is going to keep the standard. We're all watching you. And we're all here behind. And we'll see what is happening there. And we know that our group pastor is afraid, is frightened of the people he cannot handle. You are not doing the work of God with the same quality of character, of impartiality as God demands. And so you see the commandment there. I'm coming to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 1, we're looking at verse 17. In verse 17, look at what it says over here. In verse 17, it says, Ye shall not respect persons in judgment again. That's the law of God. That's the impartiality of character that he wants and demands from everyone that is uh, having position or having opportunity to serve in the church. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. You see that? You need to underline that in your Bible. You will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. Uh, now think about it now. Think about it. What are they going to do? They'll throw you into river now. Nobody can do that to you today. What are they going to do? They'll send you to a bunny furry ponies. Nobody can do that today. Okay, they are going to kill all the children with the sword because they're searching for you alone. Whatever, nobody can do that today. Or they're going to throw you into the dungeon like they did Jeremiah. Nobody will do that to you today. What are they going to do to you today? Just, just neglect you. Just reject you. Just uh, kind of snub you. Just depreciate you just be little you just do some little little things even if they are to strike you what's that that's nothing that you will stand you will take your stand and say here is the word of the lord you are commissioned and commanded by god not by man and because of that the fear of man will not be the overwhelming overruling sin in your heart ye shall not respect persons in judgment but ye shall hear the small as well as the great ye shall not be afraid of the face of man for the judgment is god's and the cause that is too hard for you bring it unto me and i will hear it now that's the law of god how is that with david come to psalm 19 psalm 19 and i'm reading one verse there before i tell you the verse tell me what you see on top of psalm 19 a psalm of tell me i can't hear you now a psalm of david now come to verse 7 the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. He knew the law. He knew that law. Look at chapter 37. Psalm 37. And before I tell you the verse, tell me what you see, the title on top of Psalm 37. 
a psalm of David. Look at what he said in verse 31. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. He knew. He knew the law of God. We're coming to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Before I tell you the verse, whose psalm is this? Psalm of David. Look at verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's why this inexcusable Egyptian man, Egyptian king, he knew the law of God and he said that law is in my heart. Psalm 101. Psalm 101. And well, before we read that Psalm 101, the verses I want to read there, tell me the title you find on top of Psalm 101. A psalm of David. Look at verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. That's David. And then look at verse 5. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut up. Him that has an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. I will not allow him to stay near me. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. Joab did not qualify. Absalom did not qualify. Ahithophel did not qualify. A lot of people that surrounded David, they were not qualified. From what he said himself, my eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way shall serve me. That's David. He that walketh the siege shall not dwell within my house. How about Joab? How about Absalom? He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. You see that? As you look at David, a gifted man, a gifted king, a favored minister, and then you see what he said about the wicked, about the sinners, and about the law of God. And he said, that law of God is in my heart. And part of that law is you will not have respect of persons. Let's now look at him with just two people. Second Samuel chapter 19. Second Samuel chapter 19. I'm reading here from verse 13. Second Samuel chapter 19, verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, I doubt not of my bone and of my flesh, God do so to me. And more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. The two people here, Joab had been his captain, the captain of his army. But many people do not understand about Joab. They are saying over here that, you know, Ahab just came in and David forgot himself. No, he didn't forget himself. He knew what he was saying. And now he was partial. He was going to give room to Amasa. No, he wasn't forgetting himself. He knew Joab. You didn't know Joab. That's why you're thinking like that. Look at verse 14. And about the, about the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, that's Amasa, so that they sent this word unto the king, return thou, 
and all thy servants. So the king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king and to conduct the king over Jordan. That's actually the ability of Amasa. But look at this job. See the real problem. We're looking at Second Samuel chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 28. 2 Samuel chapter 3. We're reading from verse 28. And after what, when David had it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest upon the head of Joab and, all, and on all his father's house. And let there not fail of the house of, of a Joab one that has an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on the star, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. What had happened is Joab killed an innocent person, a person more righteous than himself, in chapter 3. And so David had known that this fellow should not be in his presence. But you know what? He could not handle him. And because he could not handle him, that's why Joab had been like that all the time. Look at verse 39. Verse 39 of that same chapter, I am this day weak, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zeruiah, that's Joab and his brother, be too hard for me. Be too hard for me. If it were not because of their character, I could keep to the scriptures. I could stand by the scriptures. But this must be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Ah, David, you said you'll cut them off. That's what you said. The wicked shall not stand before me. I will early cut them off. But he couldn't do that to Joab. That's partiality. It was actually partial on the side of Joab. We're coming to chapter 11. Reading from verse 14. Second Samuel chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him and that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Job observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And tell me, Uriah the Hittite died also. And then Joab sent to show the result of the battle. And he said, when you tell King David that the thing was told, or defeated, tell him also, Uriah also is dead. And then when the messenger said that, David just said, well, you know, the sword goes this way and goes that way. It can happen like that anytime. I go and encourage Joab, tell him not to mind, and still face another sin. You know what? Joab knew the sin, the weakness, the backsliding, the fleshly action of David, and he covered him up. And because he covered him up, he remained partial to that man. You know, when you've, you've done something wrong, and you're not willing to come out, 
you're not willing to confess publicly and you're not willing to make right your way and this is the man is working with you job he knows your sin he knows your evil he knows what you sweep under the carpet if you want to apply the word of god to this one and to this one and to that one when it comes to him and you look at him and he looks at you and he says you want to touch me remember i have the secret and i'm the only one you sent me now to kill so and so and i did it for you and you want to remove me okay go ahead you cannot do anything because he knows your sin and because he will not open his mouth he's holding that and that holds you to ransom. That's why some people cannot stand impartially on the word of God. I pray you will stand. I will stand. Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 38. Chapter 13, verse 38. So, Absalom fled and went to Gezo. And was there three years. Absalom had killed his own brother because that brother defiled his sister. And when David heard, the, the law is clear in the Old Testament, what should be done to somebody that killed another one? He ran away. And when he ran away, he went to another place and he was there three years. So far, so good. The hand of the law is not long enough to catch him over there. Let him stay there. But he came back. And when he came back, look at verse 39. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, the murderer. You know, there's this uh, inordinate affection. You know, I love them. I love them. I love them. See what they have done. And see how they destroy lives and see how they send people to hell untimely and yet i love them i love them and that's and it says uh, he went forth to absalom and he was comforted concerning amnon being seen he was dead and then we come to chapter 15. chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 1 chapter 15 verse 1 and it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him and Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one, tri of, one of the tribes of Israel. Look at verse, uh, verse, I'm reading from verse 5. And it was so that when any man came to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner Absalom did to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom, tell me, he went beyond stealing money. Now he stole the hearts and he's going to steal the throne. He's going to steal the mandate. He's going to steal the anointing, the authority of David. Because it says he stole the hearts of all the children of Israel, of the men of Israel. Eventually, you know the story, David had to run away. Because of the compromise, if he had dealt with Absalom, the right way without partiality all this that happened later would not have happened but because he was he was not impartial and we cannot excuse him he was very much inconsistent look at chapter 18 chapter 18 verse 33 and the king was much moved and went up to his chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, 
Absalom. Where is your standard of righteousness? This is a man that rose up and drove you out away from the anointing, away from the throne, away from the, from the mandate that God has given you. And now the man is taken care of and the man is dead and now you are still crying, my son, my son. Righteousness does not matter, my son. Holiness does not matter, my son. And integrity does not matter, my son, my son, my son. That's David. He was inconsistent. And if you're a minister, you cannot be like that. You cannot love any Absalom. You cannot love any man, any woman, to the point they destroy the possibility of evangelization. And they destroy the possibility of the great commission going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you love them so much that although they betray you and although they put down the gospel, you see, say, My son, my son, my son. I pray God will make us consistent in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for your amen there. Amen. Uh, look at something here. Look at something here. First Kings chapter 2. First Kings chapter 2. David was about to go now. And David was about to leave the throne unto another person called Solomon, his son. Look at what he told him. Look at this. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 5, Moreover, thou knowest, he was telling Solomon, what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did unto me. I couldn't handle him. I was afraid of him and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Nair, and unto Amisa, the son of Jezah. I could not handle him whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes and that were, that were on his feet. Verse 6, somebody there help me out. One, two, three, go. He knew what to do. He couldn't do it. Now, he's shifting that responsibility to another person. You know, this job is terrible. This job is unmanageable. This job is a real son in the flesh and a bone in the neck. But you know what? I couldn't face him. These sons of Zeruiah, they're too hard for me. Although I'm bold against the Philistine, I'm bold against the uh, people of Siklag, but when it comes to Joab, I cannot do anything. Now I am leaving. After I'm gone, Make sure that man, you deal with him. Because if he remains there, you're going to suffer. You know, that people do not understand what David actually went through. He could not carry out the law of God that he had in his heart. But now in the New Testament, saved, sanctified, and filled, empowered by the Holy Ghost, everything the Lord wants you to do, you will do it in Jesus' name. David knew the law of God. He wrote it, he wrote about it, he preached it even, but in handling and dealing with Job and Absalom, he buried the attribute of impartiality. He forgot honesty, he forgot integrity. He was not obedient to God, nor faithful to God. He was inconsistent, unfaithful, compromising, and unjust. Why? Number one, the fear of man. The fear of man. If you have the fear of man, you cannot be impartial. The fear of man will bend you, bend your conscience. Number two, inordinate affection. He had inordinate affection for Absalom. And so even though Absalom did what he shouldn't have done, he couldn't deal with that. Number three, personal advantage. Personal advantage. I need to calculate. If I remove Joab from there, 
I expose myself. Because he was my right hand man that helped me kill Uriah. So we can cover the adultery. And once we covered that, and the man is staying there, if I touch him, then I'm exposing myself. Because of personal advantage, he could not act impartially. I pray that will not be you. Number four, because of intimidation. Intimidation. These sons of Zeruiah are too hard for me. Too hard for me. Who is too hard for you in ministry that cannot carry out your ministry? Who is so hard for you in the way the Lord has mapped out for you that you cannot do everything the Lord has called you to do the way it ought to be done? That's the person intimidating you, making you not to act impartially. Number five, forgetfulness of God. He forgot God. He forgot the law of God and he forgot the challenge the Lord had given him. Number six, truth was dethroned from his heart. The truth, the law, the word was dethroned from his heart. Number seven, parental indulgence. Parental indulgence. And you know there are people in their families, they have parental indulgence. They won't challenge their children. They won't challenge any member of their families. And when they become leaders in the church, they carry that same indulgence to the church. They cannot challenge any worker under them. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 6. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? That's David. He couldn't, uh, you know, confront um, Adonijah. And he also was a very goodly, beautiful, handsome man. And his mother bare him after Absalom. Eventually, it was compromise and negligence. What's the result of that? Of this pronounced conspicuous lack of impartiality. The result is that the nation forsook the truth. The truth fell on the ground, and the nation eventually forsook God. Look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144. I'm reading from verse 7. Again, you will see here Psalm 144. Whose psalm is this? Psalm 144, I catch you, you are not opening your Bible. Your wristwatch has taken the better part of you. Are you there? Church, my people, I said, are you there now? Psalm 144, are you, have you opened that psalm? Whose psalm is that? It's Psalm of David, look at verse 7. He said, send thine hands from above. Read me, deliver me out of great waters from the hands of strange children. That's what his children became. And he said, Lord, I'm heartbroken. Deliver me from the hands of these strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity. And the right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Psalm 55. Look at Psalm 55. Here we're reading from verse 11. Psalm 55. Whose psalm is Psalm 55? I'm waiting for you there. It's Psalm of David. Now Psalm 55. We're reading from verse 11. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. That's what happened. The city now filled with deceit and filled with lying. What do you expect? What do you expect? Because the leader, because the king, the master of the people, the model for the people, he has not been able to act with impartiality. That's what then happened eventually. Psalm 9, verse 17. 
Psalm 9. I'm reading him from verse 17. Psalm 9, whose psalm is this? The psalm of David. The wicked shall be turned to hell and all the nations that forget God. And you wonder in which state, spiritual state, did David leave the nation? How are they in their, Christ, in their spiritual life? And that's, what, that's the outcome of that inconsistency of the inexcusable and gifted man, monarch. Point number three, the integrity of incorruptible and godly ministers. The integrity of incorruptible and godly ministers. This is what he wants us to have as children of God, and as ministers in particular, we are commanded to be impartial, and we are commanded to be transparent, we are commanded to be honest, we are commanded to have integrity, the integrity of incorruptible and godly ministers. We are coming to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, I'm reading from verse... 14. Leviticus chapter 19, reading from verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear the Lord thy God. I am the Lord. Ye shall not do unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. He wants us to have integrity. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, reading from verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 17. Here it tells us. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment. Don't look at their faces. But ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. For the judgment is God's and the cause, and the cause that is too hard for you. But don't shirk your responsibility and say, this one is hard, this one is hard, everything is hard. You're not dealing with anything. You know? But the one that is really hard, bring it unto me and I will hear it. Deuteronomy chapter 16. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, reading from verse 19. Deuteronomy 16 verse 19. Thou shalt not rest, twist judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise. They're always bringing money. When are you going to say no? When are you going to say I have enough? When are you going to say there are poorer people in, our, in the church, in the locality, go and give it to them. And you're always, re always receiving. It says the gifts blind the eyes of of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Verse 20, that which is altogether just, thou shalt follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God givest thee. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1, 25, verse 1. If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Justify the righteous, justify the righteous, condemn the wicked. Job chapter 13. Reading from verse 10, Job chapter 13, verse 10. He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons in your ministry. 
in your dealings with members of the church, in your dealings with workers in your church, if you secretly accept persons for one reason or the other, have soft spot for him. For one reason or, or the other, maybe for the gifts he brings, maybe because he's close and near, I just must kind of lean towards him secretly, even if people don't know. He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. Proverbs chapter 17. In Proverbs chapter 17, we're reading from verse 15. Proverbs 17, verse 15. He that justifies the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. You justify the wicked, you find reasons, and you misquote the Bible. They bring it, they report him to you. And then you say, okay, you people who are reporting, look at this verse, look at this verse. The people you are talking to, they are adults. They know that you are just they're trying to find something to cover up that individual. And it says when you do that, you are an abomination unto the Lord. On the other hand, if he has another person, he is righteous, he is all right. But you've been looking for something to make him, you know, to get him aside. And then you now say this, this, and this. You are an abomination unto the Lord. Chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 5. Proverbs 18, verse 5. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked. It is not good. It is not good. They are cultic, but they are rich. It is not good. You know the evil things they are doing, and then they come. And you cannot open your mouth and say, this is the way of repentance. This is the way of righteousness. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Chapter 24, Proverbs chapter 24. We're reading from verse 23. Proverbs 24, verse 23. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. He that says to the wicked, thou art righteous. He that says to the thief, you are upright. He that says to the sinner, you are all right. Him shall the people curse. The nations shall abhor him. Chapter 28, verse 21. Proverbs, chapter 28. We're reading from verse 21. To have respect of persons is not good. It's not good. You're a minister, you're a pastor, you're a preacher. You're a leader. To have respect of persons is not good. For, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. He's looking for something, you know, a gift. And when you give him only a piece of bread, you can buy him over and make him partial. All the children of God, all the ministers of God in particular, are commanded to be impartial and transparent. Commanded to be honest. The Lord has commanded us to be impartial. The Lord has commanded us to be righteous and to be upright. And when you are righteous, you will love righteousness everywhere and with everyone. To act with integrity and to act with impartiality, with honesty, with transparency in every situation and in every relationship requires four things. Number one, conviction. Number two, it requires courage. Number three, it requires consecration. Number four, it requires conscience. Conscience. A person who does not have conscience, a person who has override, overreading his conscience, cannot have integrity or impartiality. But as we go to the Lord in prayer today, we need conviction, deep conviction. 
deep conviction that nothing will shift us that we know that this is the way and we're going to walk in that way conviction deep conviction number two courage daring courage daring courage that can stand up and face Job and say, Job, you know what? You're hard. You're difficult. But you do it to your own perdition. This is wrong. Instead of leaving it for Solomon to handle this, the courage has to be daring. And then you'll be impartial in Jesus' name. Number three, consecration. Daily consecration. That you come to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, you brought me to the ministry. Thank you, Lord, because you placed me in ministry. And every day I sacrifice again. I deny myself again. And I lay everything upon the altar. Daily consecration. Number four is conscience. A discerning conscience. A discerning conscience. You discern what the scripture requires. The law of God. You must be impartial. And you discern that if I'm impartial, this is what you do. And you go ahead and do it. And this work will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. You'll prosper in the work. This work will grow. And you'll do it with sincerity. Amen. It's going down. You will do it with honesty. And you will do it with integrity. Above all, with impartiality. Tonight, we're really going to pray. You need to pray this in so that the Lord will make another man, another woman out of you. You will be strong for the work of the Lord. Why don't you rise up there and say, Lord, do this in me. Do this in me and help me so that I will do everything, all things without partiality. Open your mouth to the Lord and pray before the Lord.